Welcome to worship. Third midweek service, really the last midweek service through this Advent season, where we're looking at Jesus, the Son of, and the names that he has given in his lineage, uh, people that were in his lineage and genealogy. Tonight we focus on Jesus being the Son of Scandal. And we'll talk about that in the sermon. A uh, special prayer. Uh, Ursula and Wayne, we've been keeping them in our prayers. Wayne is, they're, they're hoping to be able to do some kind of special stint type situation with them. Our situation is not very good, but hopefully they can do that. And I know Ursula has been battling, and been feeling well, and she's had a fever. She doesn't know if she has COVID or not, so they, they need our prayers in addition to Lenny's dad and continued prayers for him. And I mentioned my, uh, my friend's father on Sunday. I got a text during Bible study that he went to heaven. So um, anyway, he, he, he's in heaven now with the Lord. So with all those prayers and all our prayers, we begin this evening by singing our opening hymn, 891, O Light Whose Splendor Thrills and Blasts. <laughs>
Blessed Lord, you have caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant that we may so hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by patience and comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let the incense of our repentant prayer ascend before you, O Lord, and let your loving kindness descend on us, that with purified minds we may sing your praises with the church on earth and the whole heavenly host, and may glorify you forever. Amen. Please be seated. <laughs> Our Old Testament reading for this evening is from Joshua chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. Then Joshua, son of Nun, secretly sent two spies from Shittim. Go look over the land, he said, especially Jericho. So they went and entered the house of a prostitute named Rahab, and they stayed there. The king of Jericho was told, look, some of the Israelites have come here tonight to spy out the land. So the king of Jericho sent this message to Rahab. Bring out the men who came to you and entered your house, because they have come to spy out the whole land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. She said, yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they had come from. At dusk, when it was time to close the city gate, the men left. I don't know which way they went. Go after them quickly. You may catch up with them. But she had taken them up to the roof and hidden them under the stalks of flax that she had laid out on the roof. So the men set out in pursuit of the spies on the road that leads to the fords of, jo of the Jordan. And as soon as the pursuers had gone out, the gate was shut. This, O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. Our epistle, our second reading for this evening, comes from Titus chapter 3, verses 4 through 7. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us not because of righteous things that we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. I invite you to rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the first chapter, verses 1, 3, Five and six. A record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah, and whose mother was Tamar. Perez, the father of Hezron. Hezron, the father of Ram. Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. In many and various ways, God spoke to his people of old by the prophets. Please be seated. We sing our sermon hymn, which I believe is 370.
grace, peace, and mercy be yours this evening and always from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for this evening, as you might have guessed already, comes again from the genealogy of our Lord, from Matthew 1. A record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah, and Zerah whose mother was Tamar. Perez, the father of Hezron, and Hezron, the father of Ram. Ram, the father of Amminadab. Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. And Obed, the father of Jesse. And Jesse, the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. The name Shannon Lanier probably doesn't mean a lot to you unless you're a very, very unique history buff. Shannon Lanier is a sportscaster, newscaster type person in the Houston area. Major market for news. Houston, one of the biggest cities in the country. He is also the fifth great grandson of a man by the name of Madison Hemmings. Now again, unless you're a history buff, that name might not mean a lot to you. Suffice it to say, that fact makes Mr. Lene the son of a family full of scandal. And that scandal touches one of the most famous, one of the most well-known, and in many ways one of the most beloved families in the history of our country. On July 4th, 1826, 50 years after the signing of the Declaration of Independence, the man who wrote that document passed away after a long battle with some serious illness. Thomas Jefferson, one of the fathers of our country, the signer of the Declaration of Independence. Jefferson was a historian. He taught us things about agricultural practices. He was a scientist. He loved the arts. He did so much for this country. He penned the words that all men are created equal. On that document that was signed 50 years before his death. Without Jefferson, Lewis and Clark would have never made their trip. The Louisiana Purchase would have never, probably never been a part of the territory that became the United States of America. Thomas Jefferson, in so many ways, embodied America, what America stands for. He truly is a wonderful and when he is a wonderful man with a great legacy for our country, right? It's on the Mount Rushmore, right? Thomas Jefferson. But like all human beings, as we see through the eyes of faith, Thomas Jefferson was not just a wonderful man. He didn't only have good qualities. He also was a man of great scandal. See, after his dear wife, Martha, passed away, I believe her name was Martha, he started a relationship with one of his slaves by the name of Sally Hemings. They had four children that survived to adulthood. Madison, the great, 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 great grandfather of Shannon Lanier, was one of those children. That great man that's on Mount Rushmore that wrote the words of the Declaration of Independence kept his children in slavery until he died. The very children that he had with Sally, his slave that he kept as a slave, were not released, two of them at least, were not released from slavery until the day that he died. Talk about a scandal. Now, if you're any kind of a history buff at all, this is starting to sound a little familiar. 
because over the last two decades, this has all sort of come to be public information, the fact that Jefferson had an affair with a slave and had children, and those children are still alive, ancestors, descendants of those children are still alive today. Every year, the Jefferson's family, the descendants of Thomas Jefferson, would get together for a reunion, family reunion. But up until, I think, 15 years ago, I might be a little wrong on the date, but I think it was about 15 years ago, up until that date, none of those children that were descendants of President Jefferson's relationship with Sally Hemings, Shannon Lanier and his family, were invited to the reunion. What a scandal. What a scandal, really. One of the striking features about our Lord's genealogy that we've been reading for the last two weeks, this is the third week we've been going over this, is the fact that at that day, in that day and age, it even included women. Probably sounds a little misogynistic, a little chauvinistic, but Jews weren't often likely to include women in genealogies. It's just not how they looked at things. It was a patriarchal society. And if you were going to include women in genealogies, family trees, to make a point, you would probably include women like Sarah, or Rebecca, or Esther, women who were of noble character. But not the women who were listed in this genealogy at least not at first glance. But yet what we learn from this scandalous genealogy, if you will, is that it's all about God's grace. His family, those of us who belong to his family, are part of his family solely because of his grace and his love, not because of any kind of deserving on their part, being deserving. Not at all. The four women contained in this genealogy show us exactly what kind of God our God is and remind us that every single one of us fallen people have been redeemed by his son so that we too could be a part of the family. Now think about these women for a second in the genealogy, these four women. Just think about their background, the fact that they were included in the genealogy of the Christ. Tamar was Judah's daughter-in-law. She died without having any children. Her father-in-law, the great Judah, one of the 12 tribes, right? Patriarch, one of the 12 tribes, promised he would provide her with another husband, but he lied, and he didn't. So like so many people in Abraham's lineage and family line, Tamar took things into her own hands and she dressed up like a prostitute, waited till her father-in-law was drunk, seduced him and got pregnant so she would have children. One of those children was a descendant of our Lord. Then there was Rahab. Rahab you heard about her in the Joshua reading for this evening, was a prostitute. What kind of person puts a prostitute purposely in their family genealogy? Like we talked last week with the silly story about the Fraser show. What kind of family leaps for joy over finding out that their great, 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 great grandmother was a call girl? Yet you heard what Rahab did, how she saved those sent into Jericho, and she would later be the son of Bo be the mother of Boaz, and she would find her place in the genealogy, the lineage of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And then there's Ruth. The least scandalous, really, by our standards, maybe the least scandalous of these four women, but maybe not by Israel's standards because she was a Moabitess. She wasn't a Jewish woman. And here she, this Gentile woman, finds herself 
in the family line of the Messiah. And last but not least, Bathsheba. It says Uriah's wife in the genealogy to make a point, right? She was Uriah's wife. And the reason she came to have Solomon is because she cheated on her husband with the king who had coveted her from across the top of the palace, seduced her, and then had her husband killed to cover it up. Yet, she too is in the genealogical line of our Messiah. What do we learn from all this? The fact that the family tree of the Savior of the world is full of incestuous, prostitutes, liars, all sorts of people, people that don't fit the mold. Thomas Jefferson's family, I mentioned at the start, has been plunged into a terrible scandal. I mentioned that family reunion that some members of the family, Sally Henning's descendants, struggled and fought for years to even have the other side of the family recognize they were family members in the first place. And then to get invited finally to the family reunion as descendants of Thomas Jefferson. Third president? Right? Third president? Unbelievable. Just think about what they must have felt like during that struggle. Wondering, do we even belong? Are we even going to be accepted? Are we legitimate or illegitimate? Where do we fit in? And then when they finally get invited to the reunion, what must that have been like? Are we going to be accepted? Is anybody going to talk to us? Are we going to fit in? Are we really going to be considered part of the family? That's something that any human being who knows the sinful nature of human beings could say about their relationship with God too, right? Anybody that understands by faith what Scripture says about us being fallen, about the struggles that we have, knowing ourselves, knowing the struggles that we have in the flesh, our sinful nature, it's a natural question for us to ask too. Like Sally's descendants, we wonder at times, do we fit in? Will we be accepted by God? Are we truly God's children? Or are we illegitimate? Not really part of the family. One of the beloved hymn writers of our synod, a contemporary hymn writer, in the truest sense of the word, Thomas Franzman, wrote about the fact that all people are included in God's family and those four women are included in the genealogy of the Messiah. He wrote, they are firmly enmeshed in the history of God's chosen people and their presence speaks eloquently of the fact that history, this history is not the story of man's glory, but the history of God's grace and love. How wonderful and how true. Scandal is not simply something we can find within the deeds of other people though, right? We're talking tonight about Jesus being the son of scandal. His genealogy bears that out. But we don't have to look to names of people that lived thousands of years before the Messiah or people that lived thousands of years before us to find scandal. Scandal runs in our veins too. It runs in our family histories. If you've done any genealogy like my father loves to do, along with the good that you might find, you're gonna find scandals. But that's not even what we're talking about. We know our own scandal. We know that we don't have any more right if you're talking about good people being a part of the genealogy and the history of a Messiah and being a member of his family. 
We don't have any more right to be in that genealogy than Tamar or Rahab or Ruth or Bathsheba or anybody else because heaven knows we have done things that would be scandalous if they were known. It was a wonderful program a few years ago, the Bible study, I think, the Bible study on Wednesday night watched about a man who was walking on the street asking people if they knew they were sinners. He asked them if they broke the commandments. And of course, everybody starts, oh, no, no, I'm a pretty good person. I'm really a pretty good person. But then he went through the commandments in simple form. He asked people basically, have you ever lusted in your heart for people you're not married to? Have you ever told lies? Have you ever taken something in a way that you think is harmless or justified, but in a way that really is taking something from somebody else? Have you ever not been respectful like you should be to your parents or other people in authority? Have you ever had hateful thoughts toward another human being? Have you ever said things that weren't true or used foul language? Have you ever wished for things you didn't have, even at the expense of someone else losing them? You see where I'm going. It doesn't take long for you to realize, too, that every single person on earth is a liar, an adulterer, a thief, a murderer, a coveter, covetous person. We break them all. Just like the four ladies that are part of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. So we shouldn't sit here this evening, and I know we don't, scandalized by the fact that those four women are listed in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. We just thank the Lord that we are too. And we are. Just like the Titus reading for this evening reminds us. Just like Titus tells us. I'm going to read it again. So important. But when God our Savior revealed his kindness and love, he saved us. Not because of the righteous things that we have done, but because of his mercy. He washed away our sins, giving us new birth and new life through the Holy Spirit. He generously poured out the Holy Spirit upon us through Jesus Christ our Savior. Because of this grace, he declared us righteous and gave us confidence that we are heirs of eternal life. Dear friends, at your baptism, you were adopted into the family. Scandal and all, every bit of it, whether anybody else knows it, you do, and God certainly does, but it didn't matter because he loves you. In fact, at your baptism, the Lord from heaven spoke, though you didn't hear it the same way. Just as truly he spoke those words that he spoke at his son's baptism in the Jordan River. You are my child. With you, I am well pleased. One day in heaven, we're going to have a family reunion too. It's going to be marvelous because of that adoption into our Lord through holy baptism. We are going to feast at the table with all, all of our brothers and sisters in Christ. All of them. Not the ones that we're related to by blood. Those people too, hopefully, God willing, that they believe in the Lord. Not about our lineage, not about any of that stuff. But we're going to feast at the table of our Lord at that wonderful family reunion with all the other scandalous people, just like us, that have been washed in the blood of Christ and been baptized into his grace and his mercy. What a reunion that is going to be. So yes, really true, although it's not written in the genealogy the way the other names are. Jesus is the son of scandal. He truly is. Not his own scandal. Scandal because of those who are in his family tree. But 
thanks be to God, his family tree leads to the cross. And through the cross in holy baptism, for all of us to be brought into the family. So on this third Wednesday in Advent, as we get closer and closer to the celebration of our Lord's birth, we're thankful that our Lord is a son of scandal. We're thankful that because of those scandals, and despite our own, by his grace and mercy, we're members of the family. In Jesus' name, amen. And now may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds forever in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting.
justice, health, and protection in this and every place. Let us pray to the Lord. For those who bring offerings, those who do good works in this congregation, those who toil, those who sing, and all the people here present who await from the Lord great and abundant mercy, let us pray to the Lord. of the earth and for peaceful times, let us pray to the Lord. For our deliverance from all affliction, wrath, danger, and need, let us pray to the Lord. For the faithful who have gone before us and are with Christ, let us give thanks to the Lord. Rejoicing in the fellowship of all the saints, let us commend ourselves, one another, and our whole life to Christ our Lord. O God, from whom come all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works, give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments, and also that we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may live in peace and quietness. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Taught by our Lord and trusting in his promises, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And give us not the temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless and preserve us. Please be seated. We sing our closing hymn, which I think is 359. Lo, how a rose is blooming.
evening. It's the last of our Wednesday services, but next week on Christmas Eve, 4.30, right, Jeannie? 4.30? 4. 4? 4. 4 and 11. 4 o'clock service, we're going to continue with the last of our Jesus the Son of series by looking at Jesus the Son of Mary. That's the 4 o'clock service on Christmas Eve. The 11 o'clock service will be carol sing and a little mini homily after each of the, the carols that we sing together. And then Christmas morning, we will have worship as well at 9 o'clock. Okay? Have a wonderful evening. Drive home safely and be careful. God bless everybody. God bless you.